Okay, we're standing out here and up here in Akakik, Maryland, waiting for the golden rule to sail by. And we've got Pat Elder here. He's going to tell us why we're here. Hi, my name's Pat Elder. I'm the director of Military Poisons. And um, we've been very concerned about, um, about the contamination caused by the United States military um, in its use of PFAS, that's per and polyfluoralkyl substances. Um, they've traditionally used these substances in firefighting foams, and they would practice um, lighting massive fires um, in these 200-foot uh, diameter craters that were dug two to three feet deep. They would um, fill these craters with um, jet fuel and then extinguish them with um, firefighting foams uh, at Andrews Air Force Base regularly for more than uh, 40 years. And so the chemicals um, seeped into the groundwater, they seeped into the surface water, and here we are at the confluence of Piscataway Creek, which you can see on the right side. We're actually on the Potomac River right here. Um, four miles up Piscataway Creek is located Andrews Air Force Base, and the creek is profoundly contaminated with PFAS. So a group of activists tested the water where it flows out of Joint Base Andrews. Uh, the water um, uh, is actually courses right by the burn pit uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. So they would fill these craters up with um, jet fuel uh, and, and oil and they would ignite them and then douse them using carcinogenic aqueous film forming foam containing PFAS, that's per and polyfluoralkyl substances. And they would do this um, uh, bi-weekly and or monthly over the course of 40 years. And all of that seeped into Piscataway Creek. And so today we have um, little tiny sunfish all with almost 400,000 parts per trillion of, of PFAS um, in the fillet. And the little fish are eaten by big fish. And so the smallmouth bass and the largemouth bass here, um, the largemouth bass has been found with 94,200 parts per trillion at the mouth of Piscataway Creek where it empties into the Potomac River. And this is significant because the EPA has um, promulgated a health advisory for PFOS in drinking water. And that health advisory is at 0.02 parts per trillion. So let me pass these numbers by you again. 0.02 parts per trillion in drinking water and 94,200 parts per trillion in the fillet of fish. The fish are not regulated. Um, and the fish contain uh, 4.7 million times the concentration of the drinking water. So we have a pressing human rights and human health issue right here. And the irony is that we're standing on a dock that is owned by the federal government at Akakik National Park, which is a federal park, which encourages the public to come use the, the pier for fishing. Um, and um, from talking to folks here over the years, um, they catch fish, most notably largemouth bass and catfish, and they consume the fish they catch. So, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity um, of the um, crew um, of the um, Golden Rule as it passes by here on its way down to Indian Head. And in Indian Head, we will pick up the main mission of the Golden Rule, which is to point out radiological contamination. But we just couldn't resist the opportunity to point out the contamination of Piscataway Creek from Andrews Air Force Base um, as it passed, as the great uh, boat passes this point. So you were saying that the uh, they've been do dumping this stuff for 40 years, right? So that, like, about what year did they start dumping it? Well, um, we don't know uh, precisely um, in at the Air Force, but we know most Air Force bases began in 1971, so it's actually been longer than that. I use the term 40 years because that's been documented by Air Force reports, but probably it goes back to 1971, which would put it at 52 years. So um, it's, it's a problem, and it's been a problem, but 
uh, because of, of activism uh, across the country, the military has stopped using the PFAS um, laced uh, firefighting foams for routine practice. Okay, we're here with the Golden Rule and Pat and Julia and Bonnie. And uh, there's a reason why we came to this place and Pat's gonna tell us about that. Thanks so much, Ed. We are on the south shore of Mattawoman Creek and um, Mattawoman Creek is severely contaminated and if you look Beyond me, beyond the creek, you'll see the, um, the Indian Head Naval Surface Warfare Center. And uh, I'll call it Nav uh, Indian Head. And um, the center has been used since 1898 um, for uh, the testing um, of munitions and military hardware and for the disposal of, of these uh, weapons systems. So the um, area that you see, um, the woods beyond um, and the water are fantastically contaminated with a list of, of toxins, which I will read off shortly. The, uh, the Navy um, has completed uh, a preliminary assessment of uh, radiologically contaminated sites at the Indian Head Naval Surface Warfare Center here and has um, identified 90 um, places on the base that are um, potentially contaminated with uh, uh, radiation. And um, this is a, a serious situation. Um, the Navy is extremely slow in, um, in uh, being more detailed in its assessment and even slower in beginning to actually clean up uh, the contamination. Um, but there is um, quite a history of um, radiological contamination at 90 places um, on this base. But what's often not discussed is um, just the sheer uh, quantity of other contaminants that have accumulated here over 125 years um, and so in terms of human health um, we are imperiled um, uh, from uh, wells that we may drink from that are contaminated with these with these toxins as well as the ingestion of fish and um, and even um, the sediment from this creek dries and is um, believed to um, form as dust and collect in our lungs and in our homes. Um, so um, I th should also mention that, um, um, you know, a team of us have um, uh, requested um, through the Maryland Public Information Act, um, and we've requested information on PFAS, um, that is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that um, have been used here at the base. We know that the base has identified area of concern, love that, AOC 71, which was the burn pit where um, the Navy practiced uh, for more than 40 years um, um, using uh, aqueous film forming foam that contains PFAS chemicals. And so what they would do is they would um, have a deep trench and they would uh, fill it with uh, jet fuel and other um, fuels and light them on fire and have the, um, you know, uh, uh, firefighters practice putting it out with this foamy-like substance known as aqueous film forming foam. So we have not been too successful with the state of Maryland getting them to, it's like prying teeth from the Navy, to get them to release uh, much documentation. But we do know that um, that they have released uh, um, that that there are is quite a substantial contamination of four types of PFAS, 
PFHXS, PF, uh, NA, uh, PFOS, and PFOA in um, the sewer sludge. And so the drains from the base empty into the wastewater treatment plant. And with all wastewater treatment plants, you have uh, the uh, materials turn to sludge and the materials turn to, um, you know, the effluent, the liquid effluent, um, which is poured out into surface waters. And we were able to, to find that nearly 200 parts per trillion of PFAS are contained within, um, within the sewer sludge. We just don't know where that sewer sludge is applied to agricultural lands. And that is a big concern. Um, and so we'll continue, um, but it's not easy getting information from these folks. But in the meantime, let me just rattle off to give you a sense of the contamination here at Indian Head. And each of these levels of contaminants are um, uh, also uh, characterized by the parts per billion um, that are found in the groundwater. So aluminum, 240,000 parts per billion, everything I mentioned here in is in parts per billion, arsenic 100,000 parts per billion, barium 1.9 million, uh, benzopyrene 15,000 parts per billion, um, chromium at uh, 67,000 parts per billion, cobalt 16,000 parts per billion. But I'll leave the parts per billion out. Um, you can research this if you like. Start with military poisons, look for Indian head. Um, but DDD, heptachlor epoxide, iron, lead, naphthalene, nickel, RDX, which is an explosive used to make bombs. Trichloroethylene is found at 55 million parts per trillion in the groundwater here. This is a massive plume of trichloroethylene. Uh, vanadium is also found at 199,000 parts per billion. The uh, surface water behind me uh, contains uh, 3,900 parts per billion of arsenic, uh, bromodichloromethane, 2,000 parts per billion, iron at 7.9 parts uh, million parts per billion, lead at 2,000 parts per billion, manganese at 7.2 million parts per billion, and deadly perchlorate at 620,000 parts per billion. These are frightening numbers. We also have sediment and soil contaminated with dozens and dozens of chemicals. Um, the sediment along the banks contains anthracene, aerochlor, arsenic, benzoanthracene, benzopyrene, chromium, chrysine, copper, endrin, fluorine, lead, mercury, phenanthrene, zinc. And the soil is also contaminated. So I won't continue to read these four more pages of, of, of lists of contaminants. I think you get the idea. The Navy's been working here for 125 years and um, has severely contaminated the Naval Surface Weapons um, Center in um, Indian Head. And you know, if the DOD and the EPA have a playbook, it is to isolate all thinking about PFAS to, you know, two categories is, is it's it, it derived from the firefighting foam and it's all about contaminated drinking water when really the number one source of um, uh, number one pathway to human ingestion for PFAS is, um, you know, from uh, fish, uh, food, food first, fish, you know, uh, it, from contaminated waters is the number one way people get sick. So, I mean, you can have one forkful of filet from, you know, Brent's, uh, you know, uh, smallmouth bass up in, you know, uh, where was it, uh, Antietam Creek, yeah. and that would probably give you more PFAS than drinking water with 70 parts per trillion for until for 80 years. I mean, it's that much more concentrated. So, um, I think um, the... Uh, um, when you take a facility like um, Indian Head, PFAS is used as an engine degreaser on military bases. 
it is used to clean engine parts. And so if you have a huge base, like, you know, the home of Air Force One, you know, uh, Andrews, um, it's a routine thing that you take a, a the engine uh, blocks of these giant fighters um, and you take them apart and you clean them. And um, and what they they do is they they um, they clean them with um, PFAS. And at the end of the day, the PFAS goes down the drain and either goes into surface waters, groundwater, or wastewater treatment plants. One of the three, but in any of the three cases, it's not treated. They also use this stuff in chrome plating, um, and this may be the, the number one uh, way. And with chrome plating, you take an, a, 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 you know, a, an engine part that's made of <coughs> steel or even aluminum, I understand, and you actually put it into a bath that looks a lot like a hot tub, and the bath um, is made up of, of chromium hexavalent, which is, um, you know, a... Um, highly carcinogenic uh, uh, material. Um, and um, it has an aerosol that comes up that is deadly when you breathe it. And so they pour PFAS into these baths for chrome plating and the PFAS acts like a blanket and, and, and um, eliminates the aerosol from coming into the air. It's the same principle as you know, using PFAS in firefighting foams. Um, um, so, you know, when you spray this shaving cream, it just snuffs out the air and there's a blanket there and it puts the fire out. The thing is, they, the military has now stopped using the, um, you know, firefighting foams in routine practices. They still have them in cases of emergency, but they're pumping out unbelievable amounts of PFAS into the environment. So um, I was able to capture um, you know, from a screenshot from a PowerPoint presentation given by the Navy at the Naval Research Lab's Chesapeake Bay Detachment. Um, and it showed the stream, right, coming from the old, uh, you know, firefighting foam uh, testing area, okay? And so you travel down the stream, which, you know, the, the chart is probably about three quarters of a mile. And then up near the firefighting area, it had, you know, parts per trillion in the thousands. And by the time it traveled almost a mile, it had dropped down to 125 parts per trillion. As soon as it passed by the outflow of the wastewater treatment plant, it increased eightfold before it was dumped into the Chesapeake Bay. So you can just tell from this one graphic, it's all about the outflows from wastewater treatment plants. There's no, there's no, um, you know, uh, uh, the firefighting uh, exercises have ended. So what we're seeing is um, the contamination, say, at Andrews is all about, you know, what's being um, discharged um, through the wastewater treatment plant and, and directly into the water from, you know, sources other than the, the firefighting foam. And that's important because it can be documented. And so I spent some time this year trying to... Um, uh, work with others to pass a bill in Maryland that would have regulated or not even regulated, but calling for the universal testing of wastewater treatment plant effluent for PFAS. And then, of course, the PFAS goes into the sludge as well. And the sludge is, you know, spread on agricultural, you know, fields. Um, this is an important part of all of it. So when you're talking about Clean Water Act and you're talking about ongoing this is pretty well documented and easy to be able to document. I just um, teamed up with a woman with Kaiser Family Foundation, KFF, and they also have the KFF Newsroom. And um, they are a force to be reckoned with down the road. They're just getting into the PFAS. And um, I mean, they're, they're insurers for God's sakes. So. What, what a marriage of uh, uh, that makes sense, you know, activists looking at PFAS and the people that have to pay for the, you know, health of people that's being wrecked by these chemicals. So they came out and filmed me when I took a, a, a sample at Piscataway Creek. We got our results and it had over 2000 parts per trillion of PFOS in the drinking water two weeks ago at Andrews, Piscataway Creek. It's significant um, because 
state of Minnesota has regulations in some lakes that limit PFOS to um, 0.05 parts per trillion. 0.05. We got, you know, I think that that test was 895 parts per trillion of PFOS, many, many, many times over. Total P PFAS over 2000. Um, but the point is that um, Minnesota is saying we need to keep this stuff down under one or two parts per trillion in our lakes because the bioaccumulation factors in fish might be three to 5,000 times for some species. So if you have one part per trillion of PFOS in surface water and you got a little goldfish or a little sunflower fish, some little fish that big that eats, you know, that, that has, well, we tested it in Piscataway Creek, 375 freaking thousand parts per trillion in the fillet of a sunfish, okay, which are eaten by the largemouth bass. So you had 94,000 parts per trillion in the largemouth bass at the at the, at the mouth of the creek, you know, where it's tidal, uh, you know, in Akakate. So that is significant because it's ongoing and we can demonstrate that. Now, I don't know. The another well, thing is, is that Indian Head, um, we did a uh, Maryland public information request uh, and uh, I got data for one quarter on the PFAS discharges and it was close to 200 parts per trillion uh, being pumped into the Potomac. That's ongoing. So this is a public park right here, right? And you were showing me a map uh, earlier about all the different places that all the different little dots on that map, you know, probably 500 of them, you know, where, where uh, you know, all these uh, toxins are. And there's people coming here all the time and there's people fishing and they have tournaments here uh, every year. They get $40 million off of the tournaments, fishing tournaments. You know, this, this place is a toxic, toxic waste dump, you know, yet people are coming here all the time. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're relatively safe um, if we don't consume the fish we catch. I think we're relatively safe to come here for a couple of hours. Um, because um, I, I think our body's um, immunity systems are strong enough. But I think if you drink groundwater and you're close to this place, and that is if you have a well, and of course the Navy hasn't been testing wells in the vicinity, although it should be. But, um, and if you don't eat the fish um, and you don't eat the deer um, and other wildlife in the area, which are also believed to be heavily contaminated with a host of chemicals, not just the PFAS. I think you're okay. You come in, you leave. Um, but um, we're talking about uh, residents and their health, and it's a chronic situation. And um, this is a, a public health crisis. And I should add, you know, that, that women who are pregnant or may become pregnant are the most potentially imperiled, and so are their unborn children. Tell us who you are. Hello and uh, welcome to my beautiful homeland of the Piscataway Indian Nation. My name is Julie Tyak Yates and I'm the matriarch of the Piscataway Indian Nation. So you're here looking at the Matawaman beautiful creek that runs into the beautiful Potomac River. Our people lived on this land over 10,000 years ago. And this was our way of life. This was the rivers, the, the land before concrete, um, all this um, building interior you see, it was just beautiful Indian land. I'm here with friends of mine and Pat Elder and the Golden Rule. Um, and we're here for, which we fight for, is peace, harmony, our land, our waters, our rivers, our tributaries, our beautiful sky that brings us clear water, our rivers that are polluted. We are here to protect the environment. 
it's a fight, but I've been fighting for over many, many years, or as natives say, many moons. So hopefully, as time goes on and we send more signals out to the four directions of the world, which is north, east, west, and south, one day we will have beautiful clear water and our fish will come back to producing more fish, more rivers will not be polluted, people will become involved, and our life will become successful. And that's what I fight for. I will fight today, tomorrow, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Okay, thank you. Um, so you say that, that you're fighting right now, and I, I know that Pat's, uh, you know, an organization has been fighting to uh, stop this pollution. And uh, it's like, can you tell me about some of the things that you're doing? I am an activist. I just passed a bill uh, with the D.C. Council um, that started about three years ago. Uh, the bill was passed last year, November, uh, October, November of last year. We had a huge celebration at uh, Anacostia Park, and um, I was what I was fighting for and what I was fighting to to um, honor was our 1666 treaty that took place under a mulberry tree in St. Mary's City, Virginia, where I was actually born, in St. Mary's County, in Leonardtown. So the treaty was to give back our fishing and hunting rights. That's one thing that I was fighting for. And today I fight for my tribe, my family, my bloodline. My, I am a direct descendant of Kittimakun de Tayak. And um, if you go to um, online to or uh, if you go online, you can read more about me and what I'm fighting for. Um, I'm fighting to keep my family recognized as uh, the true Piscataway Indian people. I'm also the daughter of the late Chief Turkey Tayak, who's buried in um, um, uh, Akakig, Maryland, in Piscataway Park. Um, my father uh, was also an activist and... Um, he was fighting to preserve our land, our history, our culture, and I'm a very resilient woman, so um, I'm also a warrior. So uh, that's what I do. So I would continue to fight for whatever it is necessary to continue as a Native American Indian woman. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is Bonnie Bick, and uh, Bonnie, you were telling me earlier that uh, you also are an activist and you've been fighting for this creek for 20 years, yes. right? Actually, over 20 years. I'm very much dedicated to the Madam Woman Creek. And I know it has the pollution problems that um, we're concerned about, but it, it has a vital fishery that's very productive. And that's where I put my attention, keeping the fishery vital and contributing because it's a water quality in sync. So it's very good, very good to keep it much better. And unfortunately, the forests of Mattawoman, while they're in something called the Watershed Conservation District, the present politicians in Charles County are very dedicated to removing the Watershed Conservation District and allowing things like uh, an airport expansion and housing units that, are, that don't pay for themselves and actually create more need for services. So Madam Woman is on the tipping point, but we have every intention of saving it because it is providing clean water not only to the Potomac but to the National Marine Sanctuary and that's one of the top priorities in the Chesapeake Bay is the 
National Marine Sanctuary at Mallows Bay and Potomac River. So that marine sanctuary health is dependent on the healthy matter woman. And so while the matter woman generates a huge amount of cash with its wonderful tournaments, bass fishing tournaments, we think of it as a working economic development of the best kind. So yeah, you were talking about this bass tournament that they have yes. every year and that they... Well, they have them every summer, every, every, oh, all the sea, oh, they're during the season when the bass are, uh, in, not in the winter, but spring, summer, and fall. And they, it's a, it, it generates a tremendous amount of money and it's, it is a, uh, a development uh, of economic development that uh, is self-sustaining. All you have to do is keep the water quality in, in a position where, it, where the fish uh, get enough uh, oxygen. Do people eat these bass? <laughs> No, they're it, they're catch and release bass. <laughs> so in other words, it's a it's the people that are um, in the bass fishing um, competitions are going for big prizes, and um, they catch and release. And there's a science to that. And I know that it injures the the, the fish somewhat, but nonetheless, it's a very uh, um, it's a it's a hobby that is, uh, is very supportive of uh, keeping the water quality clean. Right. But they wouldn't want to eat these fish anyway because they're so polluted. Well, I th think most of the people with the bass fishing tournaments are, you know, more interested in, in, in the sport than, than the outcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Helen Jackard with the Golden Rule Project. The Golden Rule sailboat has just gone past the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant, which is in the background of me. The Calvert Cliffs was commissioned in 1975 and 1976, two power plants. They had a third proposed that was whose uh, license was denied. But in 2000, the uh, power plants were given 20-year extensions. So by the time they're done, they're going to be at least 45 years old. Um, they're here on the Chesapeake Bay, and the warm water that these plants discharge into Chesapeake Bay is a uh, concern for the blue crabs that live here. Constellation Energy owns them, and they're within three miles of the Dominion Cove Point liquid natural gas plant, which had been scheduled to reopen um, three miles away. So there's a small seismic risk. Um, so I don't know what happened. In 2000, the license was extended for 20 years. So in 2020, the license would have expired. Um, Unit 2 was shut down in September of 2013 after a malfunction during testing. It was reopened five, year, five days later. The Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant is still open. Uh, people here are in favor of it because it provides a large number of jobs and it provides a lot of electricity to the local population. Okay, we're talking once again with our resident expert on military toxins, Pat Elder. And uh, the Golden Rule is sailing up the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the United States. And um, as we're going, we're going past all kinds of military toxic polluted places. And we just did a sail by of the um, Naval Surface Warfare Center at Dahlgren, and uh, we're going to talk about that, but first let's talk about where we're at right now. We're actually in Chesapeake Beach, Maryland right now, um, and we're at a beautiful home of um, 
Jane Cyphers and Joe Levine. They live on the Chesapeake Bay in Chesapeake Beach, Maryland. And we are adjacent to the um, Naval Research Laboratories Chesapeake Bay Detachment. And um, this, uh, this detachment, this Navy base, is affiliated with the, um, with the Navy's research lab in Washington, D.C. on the Anacostia River. And so um, for years, um, and it continues today, um, the Navy personnel would come down here to Chesapeake Beach to experiment with a variety of weapons systems. So we have a tremendous pollution problem as a result of these um, tests. The, um, the Navy used depleted uranium here until 1992 in regular tests. Uh, what they did is, is they took um, a depleted uranium and placed it into the tip of shells. Sometimes the ballistics uh, shells were large and sometimes they were small like for bullets and they would point the projectiles at uh, at several th many thick uh, uh, cinder block concrete walls to see um, the power of these weapons and how well that they would um, penetrate the, the concrete. Um, so, so thorium is found here and um, as well as uh, um, uranium-238 uh, and uh, depleted uranium contaminates two buildings here and they are still radioactive today. So we know all this because the Navy has published a series of radiological contamination studies at bases um, um, uh, across the country. Uh, the Naval Research Laboratory's Chesapeake Bay Detachment is also notorious because it is the first place aqueous film forming foam containing PFAS chemicals were used, and that dates back to 1968. They used pretty much the same burn pit from 1968 until very recently. So that area is fantastically uh, contaminated. The Navy has revealed that um, that 8.9 million parts per trillion of PFOS, one type of PFAS, is found in the subsurface soil. Now, what that means really is that the contamination is here forever. Um, the um, the mass of PFAS contamination in the soil is also contaminating the groundwater and it's contaminating the surface water. And uh, so um, we knew this was going on and uh, I wanted to test the theory that, um, that when streams pass by wastewater treatment plants, they tend to pick up from the outflow various chemical contaminants. So um, here in um, Chesapeake Beach, just adjacent to this property, we were able to, um, to test a, a stream and um, a, a, as the stream emptied, emptied into the Chesapeake Bay and we found um, fantastic levels of PFAS, um, over 6,000 parts per trillion. The Navy had earlier published a, uh, a graphic showing um, 137 parts per trillion of PFOS in a stream, just a lazy stream, two, three feet wide, not more than a foot deep in some spots. Um, and as it passed by the wastewater treatment plant and passed by the outflow, that is the water coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, those levels of PFAS um, increased eightfold. So it told us that, um, that the process of um, of, of the affluent leaving wastewater treatment plants is responsible for the contamination of the creeks. And that's when we were able to put two and two together and test the uh, levels of the contamination as the stream emptied from um, the base into the Chesapeake Bay. So to summarize, the Naval Research Laboratories Chesapeake Bay 
detachment is heavily con contaminated with a host of of chemicals that um, have been in use in uh, weaponry tested here um, over the years. Um, I think most importantly the depleted uranium and the radioactivity prevails as well as the PFAS contamination. Okay, well, this place that we're staying in right now, you said that, you know, you tested the water here and you didn't find any. And uh, that's just due to the fact that the groundwater, you know, the way that it operates, it's like some places might get contaminated and some places might not. And then 10 miles down the road, it might be contaminated again. Right. Well, it's, it's been my thesis all along that when we talk about PFAS, that is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, we must be mindful of the most prevalent pathways to human ingestion. And we know from the Europeans that are um, telling the truth, uh, the European Food Safety Authority says that up to 86% of the PFAS in our bodies is from the food we eat, especially the fish. And so when we see contamination here, we realize that when people eat the plentiful crabs and oysters and fish from the Chesapeake Bay, this is where they are ingesting uh, the greatest amount of PFAS. Now, um, the, uh, the, the, the water here, I believe, is from an artesian well that goes down nearly 300 feet. Um, I think we're in the Piney Point Aquifer here, which means that they're drinking from water that is fully contained. Um, it's enclosed. There is, there is rock and there's clay and there's, there's um, other soils that won't allow the surficial aquifer to mix with the deeper aquifer. But if you ever you know, look at um, the sand art or, or, or if, if you had, you know, uh, if you've seen the way that ants may, may burrow, um, it's kind of like that under the ground. And so you may have a surficial aquifer that flows only 40 or 50 feet under the, under the ground, which can carry the, the contaminants to a spot where there is a break um, in the clay and other uh, materials that block the surficial aquifer from the deep, deeper aquifer. Here we tested the water, we didn't find any PFAS, but we did find 6,000 parts per trillion, not more than 2,000 yards from here, um, you know, that um, shows fantastic contamination. So, so let's talk about this uh, Dahlgren uh, place that we did the sale by. And the thing is that, you know, I understand there's depleted uranium there too. So uh, is that correct? Dahlgren has a richer uh, uh, history of nuclear contamination than Chesapeake Beach. Um, the uh, Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren um, was very instrumental in the development of the atomic bomb after um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so um, Dahlgren had a mission uh, to perform and that mission was to uh, perfect the the little boy Hiroshima bomb, um, that bomb weighed um, over 9,000 pounds um, and had a uh, uh, um, explosive capacity of 15 kilotons of TNT. Um, the bomb that was made um, and at Dahlgren um, actually weighed just 3,100 pounds um, and um, it had a, a uh, kilotonnage of up to 50 kilotons, or yes, kilotons. So uh, in short, Dahlgren is responsible for developing an atomic bomb that is um, a third um, of the weight and three times the power of, of Hiroshima. And um, there was a, 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 a series of ballistic tests that confirmed uh, the laboratory tests at uh, Dahlgren. And, um, 
It was known as the Operation Buster Jangle, and it took place um, in the desert of Nevada in 1951. And um, this, uh, this, this series of tests, seven tests in all, um, uh, had uh, explosions of um, the bomb developed at Dahlgren, and um, soldiers, um, 6,000 soldiers were used, uh, were um, uh, many miles off, and uh, um, these were called um, the dog tests. And the dogs, that is the soldiers, would rush into the blast site to within 3,000 uh, feet from where the explosion occurred um, to simulate a, a war experience. But back to Dahlgren, um, there was one point during, uh, in 1950, I believe, where a, an atomic bomb actually rolled um, out of its casement into the Potomac River and was later retrieved by a Navy frogman. Um, we find depleted uranium, U, uh, uranium-238, and uh, P-239 plutonium slathered all over um, the Dahlgren base. Um, Dahlgren uh, was one of the earliest to experiment with depleted uranium, so um, they would pack the uranium into shells and then fire the shells like we have here in Chesapeake Beach into concrete walls, some of which exist. And so if you're willing to, uh, you know, uh, uh, go through uh, the barbed wire fence, um, you can see um, what looks like handball courts or wall ball courts or whatever you call them, these giant uh, um, 20 or 30 foot concrete walls uh, made of cinder block that are extraordinarily thick where there are blast holes in there. Um, so, but um, the, the area is still radiologically contaminated. I believe that today Dahlgren has uh, uh, 82 radiologically uh, contaminated sites that are being investigated by, by the Navy. So um, um, that's pretty much what I have. Um, it, people just don't seem to understand um, that, um, that radiation is here to stay. And um, with the golden rule in the Washington, uh, Baltimore area, it's extremely important to point out that the Navy um, has contaminated uh, the ground and the waters with uh, radiation in, um, uh, at, at several facilities, including um, uh, the um, Indian Head Naval Surface Warfare Center, um, the Dahlgren Naval uh, Surface Warfare Center, uh, where we are today, the Naval Research Labs, uh, Chesapeake Bay Detachment, um, and then finally, the Naval Academy in Annapolis is also being investigated for several dozen radiologically contaminated sites. Okay, we're here in Annapolis, Maryland with uh, Pat Elder again. And Pat's going to tell us about the radiological contamination in Annapolis. Thanks so much, Ed. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the Navy has uh, made a mess of things here. Um, in um, 2020, the Navy published a list of radioactive materials it has used here. And I'd simply like to read them off. Um, it's a bit tedious, but um, I'll give it a shot, okay? These are the radiological contaminants that are found all around us. Um, americium, 241, barium, 133, bismuth, 210, cadmium, 109, Californium 252, carbon 14, cesium 137, chlorine 36, chromium 51, cobalt 56, 57, and 60, curium 244, depleted uranium, hydrogen, iron 59, krypton 85, lead 210, manganese 54, nickel 63, Phosphorus 32, plutonium 239, promethium 147, <clears throat> protactinum 234, radium 226, 
<clears throat> strontium 90, sodium 22, sulfur 35, thorium 228, thorium 230, thorium 232, uranium 235, and uranium 238. Military has always tried to figure out novel ways to kill people, and that's what you have here. We don't know a lot, just what they're willing to tell us. Due to security issues, the U.S. Navy says it cannot disclose any specific information about the types and quantities of weapons stored or maintained at the U.S. Naval Academy. The Navy is worried about its own security here at home. They don't want to tell us how contaminated things are. And they're doing a great job keeping it all from us. Around the country, data has been withdrawn from the website of the Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command, or NAVFAC. If the data you're seeking is deemed too sensitive for the public, like munitions constituent sampling at North Severn, or investigations of volatile organic compounds, You'll have to file a Freedom of Information Act request for, for that data. There are no documents pertaining to PFAS in the environment here, although the Pentagon did release data in 2018 showing 70,000 parts per trillion of PFOS and PFOA in the groundwater under us. Back to the radiation. A historical Radiological assessment released by the Navy in 2020 details the existence of radioactive sites at the U.S. Naval Academy. As the Navy describes it, potential radiological liabilities were identified, described, and categorized. We need to unpack this potential radiological liabilities. It refers to potential for the public to become sick and angry. In the Navy's way of thinking, we are potentially every bit of a threat to them than any foreign adversary. A total of 14 areas are considered potentially impacted from the general radioactive material activities, while a total of 18 areas of interest have insufficient evidence to be categorized as potentially impacted or non-impacted. The Navy has not confirmed through this report that radioactive contamination is present anywhere. This is how they roll. However, the radiological report says potential for residual radioactive contamination exists and further evaluation is warranted. It's Navy speak. Further evaluation, damn, they may be busy for a long time. After all, the half-life of uranium-238, believed to have been used here, is 14 million years. Thorium-232 also has a half-life of 14 million years, whereas uranium-235 only has a half-life of 700 million years. Mercury spills were discovered at Halligan Hall in 2007. The public has owned, owed a detailed uh, account of what happened. There's a tremendous concentration of lead in the groundwater here. How much? How bad is it? The Navy hasn't tested private wells off base here. On two occasions in 2011, cesium-137 contamination was found in chemistry laboratory room at Michelson Hall and Chauvinette Hall atomic and nuclear laboratory. The first contamination incident occurred in 2011 due to a faulty isotope generator. The second incident resulted from spreading the original release into a sink in Michelson room M1031. The Navy Academy has authorized was authorized to possess 5,500 pounds of natural uranium in the 70s. Preble Hall, Michelson Hall, Chauvinette Hall, and Rickover Hall are all impacted. Naval Support Activity Annapolis, former storage yard number two, 
is impacted, according to the Navy. In 1997, the Millersville landfill had a load of scrap metal rejected from a recycler after a radiation monitor was triggered. The landfill supervisor identified the United States Naval Academy waste shipment on May 14, 1997 as the origin of the highly radioactive material. Where is the state of Maryland in all of this? The Maryland Department of the Environment does not possess permits, licenses, or other documents associated with general radioactive materials. Their management, use, or disposal activities at the Naval Academy or NSAA North Severn. This is what we have across the country. As far as the PFAS is concerned, that's per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. As I said earlier, a former weapons facility drinking water supplies were tested and some had concentrations of 70,000 parts per trillion for PFOS, PFOA. People were poisoned here. Two years ago, I tested surface water draining from Bayhead Park near the Children's Theater of Annapolis. That's where the stream flows from the former Naval Surface Warfare Center in Annapolis. The results showed 435 parts per trillion of total PFAS, including 84.5 parts per trillion of PFOS. And this is still draining today into the tidal water of the Chesapeake Bay, just 1,800 feet downstream. The fish are, in, are poisoned throughout the region. Where does all this radioactive material come from? What's the Navy doing with all this stuff? The, uh, the Navy had a nuclear weapons uh, testing facility in, in a couple different halls close to us, and um, they actually had a, um, a, a subcritical uh, reactor here, and um, many of the uh, um, uh, radiation materials were used in weapons, although that's not being discussed. But we can see from the list of uh, radiation that they supply to the public that uh, it's pervasive throughout the area. I see. So it doesn't appear to be very well known around here, right? <laughs> is, uh, the population is not very much aware of this? That's right. The population is um, in the dark, but you got to go back to uh, the release of um, data by the Navy and uh, NAVFAC. Um, and what we see across the country is a slow disappearance of, um, of uh, records pertaining um, to contamination and the need on especially critical items to file a FOIA in order to gain the information. The FOIA process is long and convoluted and um, uh, takes many years.